I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Victory Family Church, how are we doing? Uh, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet, my name is TJ. I'm an associate pastor here. And if you had heard me speak before, you know that I always start by honoring our pastors, Pastor Adam and Christy. Just super grateful for them and for their leadership and for the vision that they set for this house. Can we honor our pastors today? Thank them for all they do. Amen. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And then I want you to put a bookmark there or put a pen there. And then flip over to John chapter 7. We're going to start at John chapter 7. And then we'll make our way back over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. While you're finding those passages, I want to remind you that our Christmas tree lighting is tonight at 5. It's going to be a ton of fun. So I hope that you can come bring some family with you, bring your friends with you. Come and meet somebody new. I know all you introverts just got like super nervous when I said that. Uh, but come meet somebody new. Let's just have a good time as a family tonight. We're going to have the train going. We'll light up the, the Christmas tree and the building with a bunch of lights. And it's going to be a good time. So come and join us at 5 o'clock tonight. John chapter 7, and I'm going to start reading in verse 37. It says, On the last and the greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not yet been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word today, and I ask that you would encourage us, that you would challenge us, that you would draw us closer to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Well, what, do you, what do you think of, what picture comes to your mind when I say the word river? I talk a lot about growing up in Michigan, but I went to high school in Wagner, Oklahoma, the northeastern side of the state. And something that we would often do on the northeastern side of the state is take the short trip over to Tahlequah and float the Illinois River. So that's kind of the picture that comes to mind for me. How many of you have ever went and floated the Illinois River over in Tahlequah? Okay, a bunch of you. It's fun. Uh, you can go down in a canoe or you can get in one of those big inflatable rafts. And, and, and I've learned that, that your personality type really has a lot to do with the kind of experience that you have floating the river. For example... My wife is extremely extroverted and loves just hanging out with people. So if she's floating the river, she's not in a hurry. She's just trying to hang out and have a good time, preferably make some new friends along the way, right? I, on the other hand, I'm introverted and I'm very task oriented. And so like for me, floating the river is just another thing to check off my to-do list. And I'm trying to check it off as quick as possible. I'm trying to fly down that river. I'm not trying to hang out. I don't want to talk to anybody. Like that's what the river is for me. And so this is kind of the image that comes to mind for me. It's maybe a, a group of friends on an inflatable raft enjoying a hot summer day, which could not be more different then the image that the people in the ancient Near East would have had when you say the word river. Spoiler alert, the Bible was not written in Washington, D.C. The Bible was written and largely takes place in the ancient Near East or the modern day Middle East. And so for the people of that day and of that location, rivers were everything. Cities were built along the rivers. Communities thrived along the rivers. Wherever rivers went, life was given. And, and rivers were so important that in one of Israel's darkest moments in their history, God encourages them by giving them a prophetic vision of a river. 
In the book of Ezekiel, the people of God, the Israelites, are living in Babylonian captivity. They have been exiled from their home. And in this moment in their history, God speaks to the prophet Ezekiel and shows him a vision of a river. Ezekiel 47 tells us that this river flowed from the temple or the place of God's presence. Said that this river flowed to the Dead Sea, the Dead Sea, bringing life with it everywhere that it went. Trees grew along this river. Swarms of living creatures found their home in this river. Verse 12 says this, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on the bank, on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. In one of the most desperate and difficult moments in Israel's history, God encourages his people with a prophetic vision of a river that was coming that would flow from the temple, the place of God's presence, and bring life with it everywhere that it went. And this vision became so important to them that every year, all of Israel would gather together at Jerusalem, at the temple, to reenact this vision during a feast called the Feast of Tabernacles. So I need a couple people to help me out. Heath, come help me. Josh, come help me. Y'all jump up on this stage. Come on, let's give it up for my helpers today. All right, Heath, you're going to be Jesus. So no pressure, all right? What you're gonna do is you're gonna take this microphone and take this card, and I want you to go find a place to sit in the crowd. Don't sit in the balcony, don't sit under the balcony, just go sit somewhere, okay? And when I give you the cue, you'll know what it is, I want you to stand up and read from that card. Sound good? All right, sweet, perfect. Josh, you are a temple leader today, all right? So they would gather together every year and they would, go, they would try to reenact this prophecy at the temple. So we've brought the temple to you today. We've got the temple that's coming up on the screen. Here we are at the temple. So the temple leaders would get up on the temple stairs. So go to the top of the temple stairs. And standing at the top of the temple stairs, they would, they would pour water down the temple stairs, reenacting this prophecy of like a river flowing from the temple, bringing life to the world. So when I say pour water... I want you to pretend to pour water down the temple stairs, okay? Uh, We don't actually have water in there because I didn't want to like injure our worship team today. And and so I need your guys' help. Whenever he starts pouring water, I need you to make the sound of like a river flowing downstream. You think we can do that? Okay, let's try. One, two, three. It's great, fantastic. Not really sure if that's water or wind, but we're gonna go with it. I think it'll work, okay? So you'll keep making that noise until Jesus starts talking. I don't even know where Jesus went, but when he starts talking, then I I need you to stop making that noise and everybody listen to Jesus because he's kind of a big deal, okay? All right. So in the first century, they all gathered together in Jerusalem. To, to celebrate this moment in Israel's history, to remember how God brought them out of exile and back into the promised land, and reenacting this prophecy from Ezekiel of a river flowing from the temple out to the world, bringing life with it everywhere that, that it went. And so it's in this setting, people of God gathered together, the temple leaders, they began to pour water down the temple stairs And as the water is flowing down the temple stairs like a river flowing to the world, Jesus stands up in the crowd and declares to everyone there, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And then it says this, By this he meant the Spirit. And today we're finishing our series on the Holy Spirit. And here's the incredible thing about the Holy Spirit. And here's how the Holy Spirit changes everything. That the river of God's love and the river of God's mercy and the river of God's goodness and the river of God's power and the river of God's healing and the river of God's grace no longer flows from a location or a building. The river of the Spirit of God now flows from you. For you are the temple of the Spirit. Amen. Hey, can we give it up for my helpers, man? Appreciate you guys. Y'all can head back to your seat. Thank you, guys. See, the Holy Spirit, he's a person, but he's also a river. 
And so far in this series, we've looked at the first invitation of the river, and that's simply this, to come to the river. Are you tired? Come and experience peace on the banks of the river. Are you thirsty? Come and drink from the river of the Spirit of God. Are you hurting? Come and wade into the waters and let God's healing presence surround you. Come and experience life with the Spirit at the river of God. But today, as we talk about the gifts of the Spirit, we're kind of turning the page and we're talking about the second invitation of the river, and that's this, to become the river, to join in on what the river is doing, to join the current to bring life to barren places, to bring hope to hopeless people in hopeless situations, to bring creation to places that have died, to bring the life of the river of God's spirit with you everywhere that you go. That's the invitation of the spirit today, to not just come to the river, but become the river and flow like a river of living water everywhere that you go. And the primary way that God flows from us like a river to the world is by giving us what we call spiritual gifts. So let's look at these spiritual gifts. We've got a chart that's going up on the screen. There's four places in scripture that we see the gifts of the spirit, okay? So we've got this first one in Romans chapter 12 that gives us seven gifts of the spirit, okay? We've got these two over here, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 through 30, and Ephesians 4, 11 that are pretty similar, and they really speak of some of the roles that the gifts of the spirit allow us to play. And then we've got this one, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, which will be our main passage today, which is kind of the most talked about and hotly debated passage in regards to the gifts of the Spirit, okay? Most theologians believe that these gifts, these lists, are not necessarily exhaustive, meaning that these are not all the gifts of the Spirit. They're merely some of the gifts, some of the main gifts that the Spirit gives to us from an unlimited supply. It's like if you say to your kids, you need to eat your vegetables, which I heard that a lot growing up, but at this point with my youngest kid, I would just be happy if she ate something other than cheese in the crust pizza. Like that would be fantastic, right? But, but say, you say to your kids, you need to eat your vegetables. You need to eat broccoli and you need to eat carrots. Are you saying that broccoli and carrots are the only vegetables? Well, no. You're just listing off a few of the vegetables from an endless supply of vegetables, right? Or I don't know if any uh, Chronicles of Narnia fans in the building, come on, where's my fellow nerds at? Let's go. C.S. Lewis, he wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He was a follower of Jesus. And there's a lot of Christian themes in these books. And in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, Santa shows up to give the main characters gifts. He's representative of the spirit and he's giving these characters gifts. Now, are, are the gifts that he gives them all the gifts that he has? Well, no, he has a bag of an endless supply of gifts, but he just gives them the gifts that they need for the battle that lies ahead. And in the same way, our God is a good God who has an endless supply of gifts that he gives to us, the body of Christ, the church, so that we can be mature and so that we can flow like a river to the world around us. Now, the word that that Paul uses here when he talks about gifts is charisma, which is where we get the word charismatic. And if you remember a few weeks back, Pastor Adam mentioned that we are a charismatic church. Why are we a charismatic church? Because we believe that the gifts of the Spirit are still available for us today like they were in the early church. Not not everybody believes that, and that's fine. Cessationism is the belief that the gifts of the Spirit have ceased. That basically the gifts of the Spirit were necessary early on to confirm the message of the apostles about Jesus, but when we got scripture, those gifts were no longer necessary, so they cease, cessationism. There's also continuationism that says that the gifts of the Spirit have continued into today. That the same gifts that were available to the early church are also available to us today. And of course, scripture still remains our final authority on the operation of those gifts, but, but it does not seem that scripture points to any time where, where the gifts of the Spirit are going to cease until Jesus comes again. And, and so maybe you're like me, and maybe you are a skeptic by nature, and maybe you've had this thought, like I've had, that if, if the gifts of the Spirit are still available to us today, then why does it feel like the gifts are not in operation as frequently as they were in the early church? Right, like for example, if the gift of healing is still available to us today, then why does it feel like healing is not happening as much as it was in the book of Acts? Which is a great question, and I'm really glad that you asked that question. There's a lot of theologians 
that believe that it is due to a lack of faith. And scripture seems to indicate that this is definitely a possibility. In Matthew 13, Jesus shows up to Nazareth, his hometown, to perform some miracles. And it said that he was kept from performing many miracles because of their lack of faith. But we also see Jesus perform many miracles in the midst of like no faith, where no one has faith, right? And in fact, those miracles are meant to elevate the faith of the people who are there. So that can't be the only reason. Uh, Some people have argued that it's because we've just become so self-reliant as a culture, right? And that in other parts of the world where they aren't as rich or privileged or spoiled as we are, and they're literally dependent on miracles from God to survive, well, they're seeing gifts happen at a rapid pace. I think there's also much to be said about the argument of intellectualism, that we've become so intellectually arrogant that we feel like we have to be able to explain, rationally explain everything, and it leaves no room for a faith that scripture says is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things unseen. It doesn't really fully make sense. I, I can stand here confidently as the preacher today and say that I don't really have the answer for you as to why the gifts of the Spirit don't seem to be in operation today as much as they were in the early church. But I do know this. The issue does not lie with God. The issue lies with us. Church, the river is still flowing. The river is still bringing life to the world. The river is still moving in dry and barren places. And I just think it's time that we stop observing from the banks of the river. And I think it's time that we stop expecting someone else to step up and do what God has called or gifted you to do. And I think it's time that we stop worrying about what other people might think or say or how we might look and that we jump in the stinking river and we let the river of the Spirit flow from us. Y'all, the world needs a church and and not not like an organization. The, The world needs a people of God, the body of Christ, who would embrace what the Spirit wants to do through the operation of His gifts. So let's look at these real quick. 1 Corinthians 12, that first passage I told you to turn to. Let's start in reading in verse four. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of surface, service, but the same Lord. He thinks I'm gonna preach faster if that piano comes out. It ain't true. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. Now, I don't have really enough time for the rest of my message, frankly, and let alone to go individually uh, by each of these gifts and talk about each one individually. If you want something like that, there's a great book called God Inside Out. You can write that down, God Inside Out by Simon Ponzinby. That is an incredible book on the Holy Spirit. You don't even have to read the whole thing if you don't want to. Read specifically the chapter on the gifts of the Spirit. It is a great overview, easy to read, easy to understand, deep dive into the gifts of the Spirit. For the rest of our time though, I just wanna split these gifts into two different categories. The gifts of revelation and the gifts of demonstration. This is a little bit teachery, so y'all go with me here, all right? Gifts of revelation. These are the gifts of prophecy, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, tongues and interpretation, and discerning of spirits. These gifts give us spiritual insight and revelation which help to deepen our faith and the faith of other believers around us. And I wanna give you an example of one of these gifts, namely the gift of prophecy. How many of you were at our Thanksgiving brunch on Thursday? Raise your hand if you're at Thanksgiving brunch. I I love hearing Pastor Adam tell the story of how that that brunch began. Uh, I think it was a, a couple weeks ago that pastor was telling the, retelling this story in staff meeting for some staff members who hadn't heard the story before. And something really stood out to me this time when he told it. Um, if you haven't heard the story, basically Pastor Adam was greeting, I think at the first Thanksgiving as a church, or the Sunday before Thanksgiving, the first one bef- as a church family. And he, was, and he asked somebody what her plans were for Thanksgiving. And she really didn't have an answer. 
And it became clear that she didn't really have any family close or have any plans or have anything to do. And so Pastor Adam said, well, my family's gonna go to Cracker Barrel. You are welcome to join me and my family. Now, Pastor Adam's family had no such plans. And so when he's telling the story in staff meeting, Pastor Chrissy is down on the front row and she spoke up and she's like, so you lied. And real quickly, I was impressed. He looked at her and said, no, I didn't lie, I prophesied. <laughs> Some of y'all are gonna use that with your, your spouse this week. And you're like, just prophesying. And, and, we, and we laughed and it was funny, but, but listen, if you know anything about VFC, you know that our commitment is to family. That we're not just going to talk about family. We're not just going to say that we're family. We're going to be family. And maybe the best example we have of that is the Thanksgiving brunch where we get together as a family because that's what families do on the holidays. And countless people have found family at Thanksgiving here. Countless people have found community at Thanksgiving here. Countless people have, have been able to deepen their faith because of relationships that were started at Thanksgiving here. And it all started because of something that our pastor said 10 years ago that now this this last week, over a thousand people gathered together for Thanksgiving together at all of our four campuses. And you will not convince me that that was not a prophetic moment in the life of this church. So often we make the gifts of the Spirit, we make them weird and we make them spooky, but they're so simple. They're ordinary people surrendering their lives to what God wants to do. They're ordinary people surrendering their voice to what God wants to say. They're ordinary people surrendering their minds so that they can put on the mind of Christ and gain wisdom and insight into situations that maybe they would not have before. Become the river and let the Spirit of God flow from you. So there's the gifts of revelation and then there's the gifts of demonstration. These are the gifts of faith, miracles, and healing. These gifts also deepen our faith as believers, but they serve the primary purpose of demonstrating the gospel to the world, thereby drawing other people to the faith, right? So the gifts of revelation, they deepen the faith of believers. Gifts of demonstration, they draw non-believers to the faith. And probably the best example that we have of this in the recent life of our church is Pastor Christie's journey over the last couple years. And when I say that, most of you probably think I'm talking about the gift of healing, but I am not. Although we have seen the the miracle, like power of God at work in her life, the healing power of God at work in her life, honestly, it's probably the best example of the gift of faith that I've ever seen up close. I don't know if you were at our last Thrive night of worship. Pastor Chrissy said something in a prayer that night that I wrote down because it has been preaching to my soul ever since. She said this, God, thank you that sometimes you heal in an instant but usually it's a process. And I'm grateful for the process, y'all. Like so often we want God to heal in an instant. We want God to move in an instant. We want God to answer our prayers in an instant. And there's a lot of words that I would use to describe the process that God often brings us through. Grateful is on the bottom of that list. I mean, think about what that kind of faith does. Not only does it increase the faith of someone like me, but it speaks volumes to the world. If she can go through that, if she can lose her voice, a worship pastor lose her voice and still worship and still declare that their God is good, my goodness, I want what they have. That's a river that brings life to the world. And that's a river that goes to dry and barren places and produces fruit. That is a river that speaks of our love, of the, of the love and the faithfulness of our God. So become the river and let your life serve as a testimony that draws other people to Jesus. Now, all this is great. All this is cool. Maybe you're like me. You're moved by this imagery. And I love this imagery of a river flowing from the temple, bringing life to the world but we we have to move beyond the imagery. We have to move beyond the inspiration because if we don't move beyond the imagery and into practice, it doesn't actually help us any. And, And I can't, man, we can't go around the room today and just be like, all right, here's your spiritual gift and here's what God wants you to operate in and here's the gift that the spirit of God is giving to you. We can't, we can't do that today. But I do think there are some things in this, the context of this passage that can help us establish some practices in our lives that put us in a place that say, Lord, just let me join the river. Let me be a part of what you are doing. So look again at verse four. It says, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. 
There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. It's very clear. These gifts, we don't get these gifts from our skills or our talents or our abilities, and they are not reserved for the most extroverted, charismatic personalities. These gifts are given to us by the Spirit of God. So if we want to operate in these gifts, we got to stay in God's presence. We got to stay in His presence. I was talking with my older daughter a couple weeks ago about Christmas coming up, and Somehow she got to talking about how, like what Christmas is going to look like when she gets older and when she has a family of her own. She's seven. She's thinking about these things. And so she looked at me and she was like, dad, are you still going to give me gifts when I'm older and have a family of my own? And very strategically, I looked at her and said, not if you don't come home. I'm trying to see my grandkids, y'all. And that's a really dumb example, but the fact is, is we can't receive gifts from God if we're not spending time with God. Can we stop complicating this thing? Like so often following Jesus really does come back to the basic practices that we've known since we were a kid or since you first started following Jesus. Are you spending time in prayer? Are you spending time in his word? Is fasting a regular part of your life? Are you turning on worship music sometimes when you're driving in the car and just saying, God, you are good in the midst of what I'm facing. Come on, are you spending time in his presence. Look at, look at verse 12. Just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its many parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit. So as to form one body, whether Jew or Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Paul goes on this entire discourse about how the gifts of the spirit are best practiced in the context of community. And as the body has many parts, so we, the body of Christ, have many gifts that the Spirit of God gives to us. And the power of the body is most on display when the body is working together. So if we wanna operate in the gifts, we gotta stay committed to the church. We gotta stay committed to the church. And I'm not just talking about a building or an organization. I'm talking about the community of faith. Are you, integ- are you a part of the community of faith that God you, has called you to be a part of? Y- y'all, remember, y'all remember Mad TV, that old like sketch comedy show on Comedy Central? I don't, it's probably inappropriate. Don't go back and watch episodes of it. But I remember Stuart. Y'all remember Stuart on there? Right? Look what I can do. That guy, you remember? You remember that guy? That's the image that came to mind this week when I was thinking about people who want to use the gifts that God gives them f- to build their own platform rather than for the glory of God and for the good of those around them. And, and listen to me very clearly. The gifts of the Spirit are not just meant to operate within these four walls, but the gifts of the Spirit are meant to operate within the community of faith. And where is the community of faith? Wherever you go. Like you are the body of Christ. You are the church. But God has called us to stay committed to a community of faith, to a body of believers. And I know, listen, I know the church has gotten things wrong and I know the church has made mistakes and I know the church has messed things up from time to time, but do not give up on the church. Let's talk about how the church has gotten things wrong. Let's talk about it. Let's deconstruct this thing and let's figure out how we can do better. But, but don't do it and then just stay just completely disconnected from the body of Christ. Stay within the community and let God use the gifts that he's given you to make us better, to deepen our faith, and so that we can draw more people to the faith. We've got to stay committed to the church. Look at chapter 13, verse 1. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, that sounds real fancy, doesn't it? And if I have faith that can move mountains, but don't have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Guys, none of this spiritual gift stuff actually even matters if we're not doing everything out of love. We have to do everything out of love. I mean, l- listen literally to what Paul says. If you prophesy, if you speak in tongues, if you can lay your hand on the sick and they are healed in Jesus' name, but you don't love people, 
you're nothing but a noisy symbol. And I don't know if you've ever tried talking to somebody when someone else is banging on the drums. If you've ever been in a worship rehearsal, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Them drummers can't help themselves. They're just over there, break time. They're just like, dude, 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 it's like, stop it. Like, stop, quit that. Can't hear anything, can't have a conversation, right? And in the same way, the world will never hear what you have to say. The world will never hear what the church has to say if we are not operating in love. If, if you speak in tongues, but you treat people like garbage, you're doing it wrong. If, if you prophesy, but you don't love the people you're prophesying to, you're doing it wrong. If you pray for the sick and they're healed and you're real pumped because that makes you look good, but you don't actually love the people that are being healed, you're doing it wrong. If you live generously, but you're just doing it to appease your guilt and not out of love for your neighbor, you are doing it wrong. Pastor and theologian C.L. Donnelly said this, love is the only context in which spiritual gifts should operate. None of this spiritual stuff matters if we're not doing it from a place of love. Church, the scandal of the Holy Spirit is not that you get to prophesy and pray in tongues. It's not that miracles and healing becomes a reality of our world. It's not that you get to shout and dance and sing and come in the altars and wave your flags and play your tambourines. That's not the scandal of the Holy Spirit. The scandal of the Holy Spirit is that the river flows not from a location, but from you. From you. So join the river. Become the river. Make this world a more loving place everywhere that you go. Become the river and and heal the sick and cast out demons and live generously. Become the river and speak prophetically over the lives of your kids. Become the river and show the world what it looks like to have faith in the midst of impossibilities. Become the river and bring life with you everywhere that you go. That's the invitation of the Spirit of God today. And understand that that invitation is not, it's not just for the spiritually elite. It's not for the hyper Christian. It's not for the person who woke up this morning at four to start their day with three hours of prayer. The invitation is to everyone. To everyone who would believe. The invitation is to the single mom who feels like they're drowning in to-do lists. And every time she tries to sit down and have a moment of quiet with the Lord, it immediately gets interrupted. The invitation of the Spirit's to you. The invitation of the Spirit is to the college student who's really lonely right now. You haven't really quite found your community of people, but yet you have this incredible opportunity in this season of life to grow in your relationship with the Lord more than you ever have before. The invitation of the Spirit is to you. The invitation of the Spirit is to the newly married couple who feels like God is putting on their heart to foster and they don't even know what that looks like and they don't know how they're going to make it financially and you're not even really sure like like you're still trying to figure out your marriage and you're like God why are you calling us to this the invitation of the spirit's to you the invitation of the spirit is to to the guy who's been working the same job for 30 plus years and you feel tired and worn out and you feel like you've been wasting your life away, the invitation is that the spirit of God would flow from you like a living water everywhere that you go, even to that job site. The invitation is to the mom, the dad, the aunt, the uncle, the grandpa, the grandma, everyone who's tired and exhausted because you feel like your family's falling apart and you're trying to hold everything together. The invitation of the Spirit is to you to come and drink from the water and experience peace on the banks of the river, but also to become the river and let His Spirit flow from you everywhere that you go. That's how the church makes a difference in the world. It's not by being a pool of the spirit where we come together and we jump in the pool and we have a big pool party where we have this big spiritual experience with the spirit and we lift our hands and we cry out and we pray in tongues, but it doesn't affect anything that we do outside of these four walls. No, 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 we are not a pool. We're a river that has been called to flow to every corner of this world, bringing life with it everywhere that we go. That's the invitation today. Would you become the river? Father, we love you. We're so thankful for your spirit today. God, I'm so thankful that your spirit that comforts me when I'm hurting, that gives me peace when I'm anxious, that gives me hope in moments where I feel hopeless. Lord, I'm so thankful that I can just come and drink from the water. But I'm also thankful today for the invitation to become the river. I'm so thankful that I get to be a part of what you're doing on the earth. So Lord, just help me find that place as I surrender to you.
pray for every person that is here, Lord. I pray that, that every person who's tired, who's weary, who's worn out, that they would come and drink from the water today. But also every person who maybe feels like their life is void of purpose, that they would jump in and become the river and see their life, their everyday life, their mundane life, their Mondays through Sundays, their, I mean, every every moment of their day and everywhere that they go as a new opportunity to flow like a living, to a river of living water bringing life everywhere that we go. God, give us, give us eyes to see that purpose today. If every head bowed and every eye closed, the, the invitation of the Spirit is to everyone who would believe. So if you're here today and you haven't asked Jesus to forgive you of your sin, to be the Lord of your life, to place your trust in him, your faith in him, You've been living for yourself, but you want to repent, which means you want to turn away from your sin and you want to live for Jesus and join what his spirit is doing today. If that's you, would you lift your hand in the air? I'd love the opportunity to pray with you today. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you. A couple hands in the balcony. Amen. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Can we pray this prayer together as a family? Say, Jesus, I love you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. Today I trust you. I give you my life. I give you all that I am. And I receive your spirit. Use me however you see fit. I give myself to you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, thank you so much for jumping on our YouTube page today. Uh, my name is Adam, this is my wife, Christy. We pastor here at Victory Family Church. We talk about family a lot, and we just wanna say uh, welcome to our family. Even if you're online, you are still a part of our family. We'd love for you to subscribe uh, to the YouTube channel and stay in touch with us. Uh, hopefully, the content here will help challenge you, encourage you, grow in your relationship with the Lord and maybe even make you laugh a little bit along the way. So love you, grateful for you, thanks for joining us.